you that the moment you said, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, at that moment you've been assigned, at that moment you, have been, you are now part of the army of God, at that moment you are called to represent Him. Week two, we asked the question, okay, so I believe I'm called, so what's my mission? Your mission, once again, is Jesus' mission. It's, it's, it's to grow in a relationship with God and to simply introduce the one that changed their life to others. It's for you to experience God so much that you need to share it with someone else. As soon as you get that nice car, what do you want to do? You want to show it off. You go cruising around the city. You go wash it. You're, 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 you're washing it in your front yard so all the neighbors could see. You're letting other people know. You're telling them all the specs and all the details about the inside and the outside of the car and what it does and, and all of that. And you memorize it and you're sharing it with others because you just, you, you are so, not you're thankful for that car, but you know you worked hard for it. You're excited about it and you, you want to share it with other people. And so when you start falling in love with God and you know, know that if it wasn't for him you would be dead right now that if it wasn't for him you your life would be a mess that you just start falling in love with him more and more that you have to share him with other people that's your mission have a relationship with him first so that out of that it says out of the abundance of that relationship you become you start overflowing and you start sharing with others you know that apple they have uh apple evangelists that's what they call them because an evangelist is simply uh defined as the one that shares the good news the the one, the announcer of the good news. And so they call them Apple evangelists because uh, they, they don't do that many commercials. But look, everybody still has an iPhone. Everybody still has uh, Apple products because they have guys there that they are trained to simply share in their communities about Apple. And so it gets people excited and they say, well, that sounds pretty good. I want, I want, I want to buy one of those. And you're not selling Jesus. You're not a salesman. You're not, you're not just going from door to door selling something. You're sharing what God has done for you. And that is our mission. And so week three last week, we answered, okay, so if I have a mission, then what's my message? What do I simply share? We learned that it's simply sharing with others how the goodness of God has changed your life and in a very simple, very personal way, in the same way that you're talking about your kids, your, your wife, your, your husband, your family, in the same way you're talking about that special, most, that closest friend of yours, and you just share it with them. You're not being weird about it. You're not going up and, and, and just repeating the five, the five things that you memorized, and you're just kind of, you know that this, this, and this, and, and, and now would you like to pray with me? No, people are going to be like, you're, you're crazy, especially in the year 2021 where the world is so lost and they, they're so anti-Christ. But you simply share with them, listen, I don't know it all, and I humbly come to you, and it seems like your life is, is, is all over the place as my life was and as my life would be if it wasn't for God. And so I want to simply share with you that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is the one that came and died for you. That's our message. And it's that simple. You simply share with them what God has done in your life. So today we want to answer if that's our mission, if that's our message, then who specifically who is our mission? Remember, this is a six-week uh, series. We're, we're going detail by detail. I don't want to simply stand up here and say, go and preach the gospel, hallelujah. And then you walk out excited, but then you're like, okay, now what? I've heard sermon after sermon after sermon, but I want to give you tools. I want to be able to tell you, okay, this is how, in a practical way, every day of the week throughout your life, Preaching, uh, uh, gospel sharing isn't for some perfect Christians, some specific Christians, uh, just for the few. No, it's for all of us, for us to live it out. It's a lifestyle of us living out this way. It, it just becomes as normal as breathing, as normal as talking about sports or the day or the weather. You're talking about Jesus, about something that actually could change people's lives. And so, so I want us to not only have that desire to do it, but I want us to have specifics. Who is our mission? But we all need to know that it's impossible to truly be a follower of Jesus and ignore what we're talking about today. This is what it means to be a Christian. We 
saying that and reminding you, a Christian is not simply a person that goes to a specific church, sings a specific type of song, maybe listens to Caleb once in a while in Stockton KYCC, and you're simply just listening and, and, and you have a specific type of music or, or a specific type of dress and, and that that makes you a Christian. No, a Christian is also someone that shares with others of what God is doing. This is a responsibility that we all have, no matter your age, no matter your experience, no matter how long you've been a Christian. And so if you're still kind of testing this whole uh, God, Jesus, church thing, just know that this is what it means to be a Christian. We have a privilege of doing this, of changing people's lives, that God could do it on his own, but he chooses to do it through us, that he could be the one that simply takes care of it all. But how privilege we are that we are called no one sees Jesus face to face right now some get to do it some actually have had not only dreams but have had very specific uh, uh, amazing supernatural experiences with the living Jesus Christ they've seen him face to face but we get to be his hands his feet we get to be his voice the world doesn't see Jesus face to face but they see you and we represent him what a privilege what an honor don't see it as a as a baggage that you have to do you get to do this and it's so exciting and this morning I don't even have points for you I want to simply go quickly through these through uh, two stories in the Bible that will hopefully just point you towards who your mission is and so let's go to John chapter 2 in verse 24 and 25. We're going to be staying there in the, in the gospel of John. We're going to look at a couple chapters right here. But in chapter 2, beginning in verse 24, it says something very interesting. It says, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. He didn't trust himself to them. For he knew all the people. He knew their motives. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. You see, at this time, there was these Pharisees, there was these religious leaders, there was also, so you had one extreme of people who just literally hated that, that he knew so much, but also were scared of him because he not only knew it, he was in action, he was, he was changing people's lives. He was praying for people and they were being healed. He was sharing things about, about the Old Testament that, that only the, not, not even the best Pharisee, the best uh, religious expert knew. He, there was something special about him, so that brought fear to them. They were angry that the son of Mary and Joseph, people were calling him the son of God, that, that he was just simply from a little town called Nazareth. Nothing good could come out of there. And so you have that group, but then you have also the other group that were simply there to, to get uh, uh, something from Jesus. They wanted either food, they wanted a healing, they wanted, they wanted to get something from him. And so they would go to go listen to him and get close to him. And as soon as they got what they wanted, and he said, I healed you, but I healed you so that you could submit your life to me. I'm not just your healer, said Jesus. I am also your Lord. I am now in control of your life in a good way. You're no longer having to to trust in your own strength, in your own, uh, uh, the, the things that you have, your own talents. But now I'm in control and I want to take care of you and provide for you and love you. But the, the, the people that simply were there to get something from Jesus, as soon as they got what they wanted, they would leave. As if that still happens in church today. Amen. There's still people that will go to the tent revival. They will still go to that special service. They will still go to a, to a special Easter Christmas service. And they'll go and they'll get their prayer and they'll get whatever they, whatever they, were, they were hoping for. And then never see them again because they got what they wanted. They treat Jesus as if he's just a Santa Claus or a genie or something that you just go whenever you're in need. But as far as submitting their life to, to him, that's why Jesus said, hey, I, am, I am the way, the truth, and life. And Jesus said, you have, to, you have to eat of my body and drink of my blood. At that moment, they didn't understand what that meant. And so they just simply said, oh, this guy's crazy. That's too much. That's too difficult. I'm leaving. I got what I wanted. I ate with the other 5,000. I got my fishes, my loaves of bread. I am good. And so they simply left him. Jesus tells Peter, he says, are you going to leave us? Are you going to leave also? Peter says, where else will we go? It's that other group that we want to be part of. The group of disciples that recognize that we might not understand it all, as Peter said, but Peter simply said, where else are we going to go, Jesus? You are the one that is the giver of life. 
And so when we go to Jesus, we have to go to him in not, not just simply questioning him, just simply doubting in him, s- simply accusing him of things as the world still does today. And we're not here simply to just get something from him. We're here to submit our life to him. And so Jesus is telling them, I know their motives. I know the people. So Jesus knew all the people and knew what was inside of them, it says. He started his ministry. He, he gives us these, these two complete opposite examples of the kinds of people, the mission that God loves to work with. And I want you to simply understand that who is your mission? People are your mission. It is people. Your mission is not to grow a strong ministry. Your mission is not to somehow have a church. Your mission is not to make money off of God. Your mission is not to somehow get famous off of God. Your mission is not just to impress others and your family about who, what you're doing now. Your mission are the people. And so here, Jesus is giving us an example of two kinds of people. And listen to to the next verse. Now, go to chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, one of these guys, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now, I'm not going to go too much into detail in this story, but here's this Nicodemus, this man that, that you would think had it all under control. He he would he had he had understanding of the old testament. He he understood who God was. And Jesus was having a conversation with this very religious man named Nicodemus. And and we're not gonna go really go into deep into this, like I said, but Jesus has a spiritual conversation with someone that you would expect to have it all figured out. Think of like a pastor today of a church. But he ends up correcting some very basic beliefs to Nicodemus. Nicodemus asks Jesus, so what do I need to do to be part of this kingdom that you're speaking of? Because Nicodemus himself was, was, was having some questions and he's saying, everything I've believed so far, it seems so religious, seems so just a, a list of rules, but I want to follow you, this Jesus. Now, 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 rabbi, teacher, teach me, what does it mean? What do I need to do? And he says, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus, as most of us would ask, said, what do you mean being born again? Like back in my mother's womb? That doesn't make sense. And Jesus says, no, 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 not not literally, but spiritually. You need to die of who you used to be, and you need to be born again, have a brand new life, not just simply cleaned up. A lot of people go to church and they they say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't smoke, I don't cuss, I don't, I don't, I don't do those things anymore, and so now I'm just cleaned up on the outside. No, 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 no. No, now you need to be born again, be back come back to a new life in Christ. And so here, Jesus is having this conversation with this man that you would think that had it all figured out. Jesus, because sometimes someone that appears to be the super Christian doesn't mean that they're not still struggling with with questions about their own faith. Then Jesus leaves there and has a profound conversation, no longer with a Pharisee, a religious leader. But now he has this real deep conversation with a woman, a woman. Now, I've shared with you how men at that time, Jewish tradition believed, thought about women. Women were simply the child bearers, the, 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 the ones that took care of the home, the ones that, that uh, you married more and younger ones just to simply have more children from them. And if they were not able to give children, then you, you moved on to the next and usually, especially if they were widows without and, and never had children, they were left by themselves on the street, homeless, to die on their own. No one took care of them. That's why it was so powerful that, that, that God calls us to take care of the widow. Because at that time, they wouldn't, especially if they didn't have sons of their own. And so here he is speaking to a woman. And he, and he makes this important uh, uh, just he, he walks and makes it important to be with her. He wants to point her out to us also. Holy Spirit, as he was writing uh, uh, John chapter 3, John chapter 4, we not only see the, the Pharisee that had questions that seemed to have it all together, we see this woman now that seems like she has nothing together. And, but at the same time, no one is off limits when it comes to talking about God. And so again, when we are sharing with others the mission, when we're with them, 
We need to not make, okay, this person needs him, this person doesn't. No, we need to simply see that God sees us all in need, in, in need of who he is. And so John chapter 4, verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, John the Baptist. Although, it, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So he kind of left the big city of Jerusalem, going out into the towns. Now he had to go through Samaria. One of the most powerful verses in the whole Bible. He had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Now, we read that he left Judea to go to Galilee. Now, most Jews would actually make this trip longer than they would have to by intentionally missing all of Samaria. They could have simply gone from they could have simply gone from, from uh, uh, you know, go on, on hammer and, and to get down to uh, uh, they maybe just go on, go on Wilson and then take Sanguinelli or, or, or water, Waterloo and then, and then come here to the church. Oh, no, 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 no. But these people would have to, they'd rather go all the way around the freeway, take the four, take the crosstown all the way on the 99, all the way to get here just to not get close to Wilson Way. Just to not have to drive through the east side of Stockton. Think of it that way. These people hated these Samaritans. Remember, remember the Jewish people hated these Samaritans because they saw them as sellouts. They were the people that intermarried with the people of the land so that they were only half Jewish. They weren't full-blooded Jews. And so the Jewish people, they, they, all they had to do was from get to one, one side of, of Israel to the next, just go through Samaria. Oh, no, no, no. They would take hours, sometimes days, to simply go and walk all the way around Samaria. Not where those sellouts, those, those, those half-Jewish people. And so that's very interesting is that Jesus actually went out of his way to go through Samaria. Verse 4 again, he had to go through Samaria. He knew his mission. His mission was to get to Samaria because there was a woman that he needed to speak to. He did everything possible to get to you. Doesn't matter where you were. Doesn't matter what part of life you were. Doesn't matter what kind of sin you were in. He had to come to you because he wanted you. He loved you. And that's what we need to realize. That he is not a God that only chooses specific people. He does the impossible to get to us. He came specifically to this woman. He had to go through there. And the scene we're about to read is the only scene we read during this trip, meaning it was the most important thing that happened during this trip. A conversation with a woman. Now, now I don't want to be, you know, uh, disrespectful to the ladies in this room. Happy early Mother's Day, by the way. <laughs> But like I keep saying, I want you to understand how in that culture at that time, you don't go out of your way to go talk to a woman. You don't go, go and especially a Samaritan woman. Oh, and especially the kind of woman that we're about to find out who she is. But Jesus does everything to get to her. And he sits down at this well by himself. And we'll learn later that his disciples had gone to go get some food. So now Jesus is there by himself with this woman. And it says in verse 7, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, Whoa, 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 whoa. you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink. First of all, you should not even be talking to me. What are you even doing in Samaria? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She recognized him right away. This is a Jewish man. She didn't know who he was. She didn't know that he was Jesus of Nazareth. He just simply recognized that this man is a rabbi, meaning he's Jewish. He's from, he's from Israel, and I'm Samaritan. You shouldn't be talking to me right now. Right away, she gave her excuse of why this conversation shouldn't even be happening. 
right away when you start talking to people about Jesus, oh, I don't, I don't need anything to do with, I don't, just don't, just leave me alone. No, Jesus, no, 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 you're one of those crazy Christians, you're here to evangelize me, I don't want anything to do with you. But I love that Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, who, is at, who, who, who it is that asks you for a drink, you have had asked him and he would have given you not just water, but living water. He says, I don't want to just get water from you. I want to give you water that's not going to just simply uh, make you thirsty later. You're never going to thirst. I will give you living water that's going to transform your life forever. For never again will let you ever thirst again because I will be the living water for you. And so Jesus is saying, if you only knew who you're talking to right now, in the same way when that person begins to give you all the excuses, just tell them, if you only knew that what I'm about to share with you could just completely transform your life for the better. That your life will never be the same. And it's going to affect your family and your children and your children's children and future generations. If you just give me a second right now, I just want to share with you about this God. So before you walk away, before you do any of that, before that coworker begins to act weird with you, just simply tell him that. But then this woman, he, she says, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, water with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? So she still, obviously, she just didn't understand exactly what Jesus was trying to say. She simply was like, well, you don't have buckets. Where's your bucket, sir? Can you please uh, uh, tell me how you're going to get water? I'm not going to lend you mine. <laughs> I'm not going to lend you my jar, my, my, my pail. How are you going to do this? How are you going to draw water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? From generations before, all the way to the Old Testament book of Genesis, all the way from back then, that well had been established there. And so she also recognizes God, the same God, the same God. But she knew that her and her people had made decisions to be disobedient to God. But still, they trusted that God would still be good to them, even though. And so he's, she's asking, how are you going to get this water out? You're saying living water. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again from this well. In other words... Not just talking about literally. See, Jesus is awesome. Jesus is, is so, is so uh, just, he's so smart. <laughs> he's, saying, he's saying, I'm not just talking about this water, but you're talking about Jacob. You're talking about the Old Testament. You're talking about the stories of past generations. You're talking about traditions. You're talking about religions, Judaism. You're talking about all that. You're still going to be thirsty at the end of it. You're going to keep drinking from all of these things. He says, I want to give you something more. I'm not giving you religion, tradition, stories. I'm not giving you simply just this water, these, these more and more of the, of the past things that have been shared, as those people will tell you. No, 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 well, I'm sorry, I'm Catholic. Or sorry, no, 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 I can't. I, 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 I go to a church already. Okay, when was the last time you went? And, you know, they say, I'm Catholic. I say, wonderful. All right, I believe in Jesus Christ too. And, and so what church are you going to? Well, I haven't been to church since 1998, but, but God, is, I guess, you know, I still trust in him and I still, I still pray to him once in a while. You know, we're not talking about all that because you're going to tell him, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to change you, convert you to a different religion. I'm not trying to get you to just come to my church. I'm trying to share with you water that's not going to make you thirsty anymore. You've gone and you drank that religious water before. You've gone and drank that Kool-Aid before. You've gone and drank those things from, from other religions and other, and other walks of, and other faiths and other new age things and stuff that, that people are figuring out now as if it's new. Now it's all the same witchcraft from, from generations ago. But they're all figuring, they're trying to get all this stuff... That's still that water that's still going to make you thirsty at the end. And so she, he's simply saying, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I'm telling you, right now, when, when those of you that know Jesus, that know what the cross, what he did for you, that you know that he's alive, that you know that when you get up in the morning and you begin to pray and you're saying, thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for your mercies. Right now, when Brisa was leading worship and she was saying, thank you, God, how many times have I failed you, but you still love me. You still forgive me. You still pull me out. I was that, not, that one sheep out of the 99 and you left the 99 to come and grab me out of sin and you saved
saved me and you cured me and you comforted me and you restored me. When you begin to know that Jesus, you become that spring of water welling up inside of you. That's why, that's why you don't need a pastor or a preacher to say, come on, go and share the gospel. Come on, go and be a Christian. No, you start getting, you start meeting him more and more. You read the Bible. You read those, those, those two, three verses in the morning, and you're just reading them. And you're like, that's so good. That's true. That's so beautiful. Thank you, God. The first thing you want to do is get on Facebook and, and take a picture of it or share it and share it with someone, and you're just excited because of that. The first thing you, you want to do is you get into car to, on your way to work you start listening to worship and you're just so thankful you get out of the car at work and you're just like yeah and you're ready and you're excited to work but also you see everybody else oh, coming in and then that's the last place they want to be and they're like why are you so happy why are you so cheerful because God is good because he's so good to me because he loves me because he's been he's he's changed my life you become a spring of living water just coming out of you all the time and so as we seek to answer this question then who's my mission I think it's interesting how the different people in the scene they apparently saw this woman again how the Samaritan woman saw herself you shouldn't be talking to me I'm just a, I'm just a woman I'm just a Samaritan you shouldn't be talking to me she came at noon it says who gets water at noon first of all again we know heat and we know that you should not be out at a out in the desert in the Middle East at noon also, we know that heat causes water to go lower, and so obviously that's a really dumb time to go get water. But why was she doing this? Because she had a past. We're going to see right now that she had a past. She had had many husbands before, and now the one she was living with was not her husband. And so she's probably thinking that I do not want to be there at the early hour where all the other women, when all the other wives, some of them I've been maybe, maybe with, with their husbands now and they're, now they're their new husbands. And these same women that all talk stuff and garbage and, and, and they all gossip about me. I don't want to be at the well at that hour because uh, I'm not worthy I'm just tired of all them talking behind my back and them all whispering at each other. How many times do you think she went at that early hour to get water and all the women started to just started to whisper and stare at her? And you know how women are. And they start <laughs> and they start talking about her and looking at her and pointing all the all the mean girls, all the mean girls just being just rude to her and all that. And so she said, forget this. I'm not coming at this hour anymore. And finally, in that shame she had, she'd rather Go in the middle of the heat of the day. There are people that you know that right now have that kind of shame right now. That are going through the day, try not to talk to anybody, try not to. They, they, they are just over life because of all the decisions that they've made and the decisions that have, that of others that have affected their life. And so just think about how she saw herself. And here is this man. She still doesn't know that this is literally God in the flesh in front of her. But this man is willing to talk to her, and he's promising her living water that's going to spring up. And, there's, and maybe at this moment she's still thinking, well, hey, I want some of that water. I don't have to come anymore at noon anymore. I want water that's always going to be coming out. And she's probably still thinking literally a, a well. But she doesn't understand it all. She just wants to push this man aside because she's so ashamed. But also think how the disciples saw her. Did they even see her? Did they even see this woman? They simply said, you know, they probably, Jesus is, is, is there walking with them, and, and, and Jesus is, is slowing down. He sees the well. The woman is on her way. And the disciples could obviously see her, but they're just like, uh, some woman. Let's go get food. Who's hungry? There's, there's John and James and Peter, probably, of course, Peter. Peter's like, I got to go get some food. Let's go. I'm hungry. We've been walking forever. Jesus, you hungry? Let's go. Jesus is like, I got something to do here. He saw his mission. He saw the woman. He saw his daughter. And the disciples, they simply, uh, it's a woman, whatever. They simply kept walking. They simply kept walking away. They just walked right past her. They were too hungry to notice her. What's so beautiful about that moment, think about just the disciples, because I love it that there's that parenthesis there in verse, in verse 9. That little parenthesis, no, wait. In verse, it was higher up. Verse 8, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And it doesn't even say that they even saw the woman. She was there. Jesus was there. 
What's so beautiful about this is that after the Holy Spirit had transformed the disciples in the book of Acts, after Jesus had resurrected, after Jesus had ascended into heaven and he said, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. After Acts chapter 2, where the day of Pentecost, they were worshiping, they were praying, and all of a sudden they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they started to speak in tongues. That is the difference, church. That is the difference from being able to say, I want to go share with others, but I can't, to I have this well of living water inside of me. I have the power of God. The creator of the universe is now living inside of me. That this is not religion. That this is a supernatural, the spirit of God living inside of me. That they went from these guys that didn't even see this woman that would just kind of, they probably were getting a little bit arrogant at this time because they were disciples of a rabbi. There were once, there was one fisherman, that's all they were, but now they're disciples of a rabbi. It, it, it makes me laugh some places where I go, some churches where it seems like the, like the ushers think that they own the church or something. And, and they're walking around with their, with their three-piece suits and everything. And it's just like, dude, relax, you're the usher, calm down. Or I want to tell the pastor, hey, dude, relax. God will take this away right now if you, if you, if you keep acting this way. Stop being arrogant, prideful, uh, uh, just conceited as if, as, if, as if this is all from you. And so these disciples were starting to do this. And, and, but what happens is that after Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 3, it's not in, your, it's not in your notes or on the screen, but in Acts chapter 3, there's a moment in which John and Peter, they're going to the temple, and as they go to the temple... The John and Peter, from before the Holy Spirit filled them, from before they would have just simply kept on walking into the temple because they had stuff to do. But there was a man there at the door of the temple, this beautiful door, that usually when you're walking in, you're staring at the door because it's beautiful, made out of, uh, of, it said it was made out of Corinthian bronze. I guess that's very beautiful, very expensive bronze. And so people would just be staring at the doors. They're walking in to worship the temple. But it says that at the temple door, there was a man that would lay there every day. Homeless man, lame man, couldn't walk, just laying on the floor. And I love it that it says that Peter and John saw this man. They saw him. How many people in our city are walking around like this woman? Are walking around or not even just laying there on a corner somewhere? And yeah, they made the decision, so did you. Don't start with this whole garbage of, oh, well, they're, they're, they're drug addicts. Oh, and they made bad decisions. Oh, and well, God, you, we made our own decisions too. And God still chose to save us. God still put someone there in our life to share the gospel of Jesus with us. And so those people are our mission. Yeah, even those people. And I love that Peter and John, they looked at this man and they said, What? Look at us. He says, look at us. And so this man who probably his whole life just kind of had his hand out, but wasn't, just felt so much shame that never looked up. And finally at that moment, he looked up and he asked for some money. And it says that Peter and John, they simply said, what, well, we don't have silver or gold right now. We're being honest. But what we do have, we'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, why don't you stand right now? The man says that he stands up and it says that Dr. Luke, the one who wrote the book of Acts, that Dr. Luke says, and immediately his ankles began to get strong and immediately he starts to worship the Lord and praise the Lord. And it says that he started running into the temple, the place where he had never gone before. It was because Peter and John stopped. They stopped to look at the mission, to look at him. And they stopped and looked at him and shared with him the Jesus that they had. They had no money. They had nothing else to give them. But the best resource that they had. And church, the best resource that we will ever have. We might not always be able to pay all the bills. We might not always be able to have what other places have. But as long as we have Jesus, we are so much more wealthy than any other church. Than anything else. We will be able to go and share Jesus Christ to this community that is in need, that is there begging with their eyes down. You've seen them, church. You've seen my, 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 my homeless brother, my homeless sister, that they're there laying on the floor and they're just with their hand out and they don't even look at you anymore. Sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes they're, they're, they're so high at the moment. They're so drunk. Sometimes they're just so, so, they're just so hot out there and they're, just, they're done. They're done. They're done with life, but they're still begging for something. 
And you're there to say, I don't have all the money. I'll, I'll buy you lunch. I'll buy you a McDonald's gift card right now if you want. I'm not going to give you money for, 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 for alcohol, but I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give you some money. Let's go. Let's go. I'll buy you a cheeseburger. And at that moment, you have an opportunity to make that your mission. You have an opportunity to simply share with them the eternal life. Don't be like the disciples that simply walked away from this woman because they were too hungry to even care about her. They had something to do. Be like the disciples, like John and Peter in Acts chapter 3, that stopped and looked at the man that needed something. And his life was changed forever. But look at how Jesus, how Jesus saw this woman. She, she was worth it to Jesus. She was worth him having to go through Samaria. He knew people were going to st uh, talk stuff about him. He knew people were going to were going to start gossiping about how oh he stopped and talked to a Samaritan woman at the well. He knew all of that. He knew all the criticism, but she was worth it. She was worth going all out of his way to meet her. She was worth crossing all those social barriers. That those moments where you're you're at the gas station, you get off and you got to go pay and and you're at the and you go and you walk in and you got places to go, things to do. That person is worth it. At work, that person, I'm not just telling you to go and do that because sometimes we, we, we limit ourselves to think that that's evangelism. I'm talking about that person at work that you're sitting with every single day or that, 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 that neighbor that you talk about with, about with him about everything else. He's worth it too. That family member, that, that sister of yours, she is worth it. But also, Jesus saw that she was persistent she was persistent still. Now you might ask, where do you see persistent? Where do you see that she didn't give up? Check out what happens next. In John 4, now verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, <laughs> again, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Give me some of that. Yes, no longer at noon. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. And she said, oh, no. Okay, well, sir, I have no husband, she replied. And she's probably thinking, oh, hopefully he thinks that I'm single. And I have no husband. And she's not wearing a ring on her hand. And so she's thinking, she's thinking oh, maybe he, maybe he wants to make me his wife. And so she's like, well, I have no husband, sir. And he says, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is now is not your husband. What have you just said is quite true. Jesus just called her out. Jesus just said the truth. Jesus was just direct, right to her. We like a nice Jesus. We like a Jesus that just accepts us how we are, just loves us, doesn't matter what, that, that hey, as long as I try to be a good person, Jesus is going to love me. Hey, you're in sin, you're going to hell, and you're still making decisions even though you say you are a Christian, even though we say that we still believe in Jesus and His holiness and His perfection and His word, and then we say that we are obedient and that we're following, we're following His word in everything, but we still are maybe not living with a man, but maybe you're still in sin, whatever sin it is. And we're still just purposely going against his will. We don't like that Jesus. We don't like the Jesus that calls us out. We don't like the Jesus that still says this is wrong and you need to fix this because you are representing me now. And I want to use you. And I want you to be free from having to be so, uh, uh, just so always worried because it's not about just simply the sin, but it's about the shame. And it's about the, 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 the lies that the devil will use all of that sin to say, you, who are you to be on mission? Who are you to be a Christian? Who are you? Can't do this. Just go to church, sing a few songs, say amen once in a while, give your offering, and go. That's all you're good for, says the devil. And we're still just, as, just answering all that and saying, yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, and just believing all that, and we don't live free from that sin so that God could just use us. God wants to free us. God wants us to just be no longer just in that sin that we have all the excuses in the world. Everything else makes sense more than following and obeying Him. Now, it says that, she says, I, have a man, I, I don't have a husband. He says, yeah, you're right. 
The one you're married, you're living with right now is not your husband. Now, I've heard about 20 sermons focusing on this woman's sinfulness and shame. Yes, and I'm sure that this is part of her story, and she had a lot of things from her past that she was not proud of. But in the first century, Middle Eastern culture was a man-centered culture, like I said. Man-centered world. Now, women were seen as a second-class citizen, and men had the power. It was completely acceptable for a man to have several premarital, premarital sexual relationships. It was okay. It's completely acceptable. Oh, but not a virgin girl. We need her to stay a virgin. She has to stay a virgin. But the men, the religious men, they, were, they did whatever they wanted. And if a husband wanted to divor divorce his wife, because his wife, whatever, she's getting old, she's not, she's not as, as pretty anymore, she can't give me babies anymore, whatever. I'm done with her. I like that other young girl walking through Jerusalem. I'm going to go to her, and I'm going to tell my wife, I'm going to simply say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Priest, give me a, a certificate that says I divorce her. The priest says, hey, you got it, my man. He gets divorced, he gets it, gives it to her, peace. And he goes off, and he starts living with someone else and marries her. It was that easy. So now, the, the, and now that woman is the one that's been divorced. No man is going to want to be with her now because, again, she's no longer a virgin. She's been divorced. She's left. She, she was left to the side. She's not good enough. She's older. And so this isn't a woman that simply jumps around from guy to guy, this woman that we're talking about. This is probably a woman who has been used and abused over and over by multiple men. She knows what it's like to feel pain and loss. She probably is carrying some bitterness and anger along with her shame. So she's angry and she, she's like, who is this Jewish man talking to me and fine, whatever. I've talked to some people like this. You've talked to people like this. You have people in your family like this, co-workers like this, friends who just, they're just bitter at, at the world because they've gone through so much and people have taken advantage of them. But here she is, she's not giving up. She's still going. She, she could have simply ignored Jesus. And as Jesus talked to her, what was she doing? As Jesus spoke, she kept asking more. I want more of this. Yes, yes, give me some of this water. She was being persistent. She still didn't give up. She's not giving up. She's still going. She's still uh, day after day going out to this well, even before Jesus. She could have given up because of the women, but she still kept going. She still had, to, had a life to live. Maybe everyone else missed something that Jesus saw because he knew what was inside of her. He knew what kind of, what kind of persistent, strong woman she actually was. How he could actually use her for his glory. And so here, this becomes the obvious part of the story later on. Now, in verse 39, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did, she said. Because he tells her, go and share what you just received here to your town of, of Samaria and go and share with others. She would go and she simply said, this man knew everything about me. He was more than a prophet. There was something special about him. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days. They said, we want more of you, Jesus. Tell us what you said to her. We want some of this living water. Because when she was changed from the inside out, the first time a man, and, and more than a man, this God just finally accepted her the way that she was and forgave her sins. She wanted to live her, her life for him forever. And so she leaves, goes to the town, tells everybody about her, about Jesus. Then these people are saying, Jesus, come to us. He stays there for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Hallelujah. I want you to understand that the very next verse says that Jesus left for Galilee after two days. So all of a sudden, there's a spiritual revival among all the Samaritans. People are wanting to talk about Jesus, and, and, and they're, they're calling on Him as Lord and Savior. And that goes on for two days. And how does it happen? The, the very woman that people had cast aside because back into a, 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 a come, that, that they had cast aside because of her past life, she comes back into the village, and, and people, the people that had rejected her and convinced them to meet. Uh, she convinced them to meet this, this friend of hers, Jesus. 
Because what's awesome about this is that we don't have to go and save them. We don't have to do anything. All we have to do is let me tell you about Jesus. Let me point you towards Jesus. He's going to do this for you. So, so when you bring them to Jesus, that's all you need to do. You're not the Savior. You're not the one that's there going to have to change anything for them. All you need to do is bring them to Jesus. And I don't picture her handing out a few flyers. Because of who she was, it couldn't have been easy for her just to stand on the corner and pass out flyers. No. She, she pleaded with people to come meet the man who told her everything she'd ever done. She wouldn't take no for an answer. How many times do you think she went back into town over those two days to convince them again and again and again to meet Jesus? She is, she is this one special woman and one of the most surprising and dynamic leaders in the whole New Testament. I want you to understand that, that uh, like if we're just talking literally, she was the first missionary, evangelist missionary, that Jesus was there dealing with his disciples and, and teaching them. But for this woman, all she, all she had to do was hear about this living water. She wanted more. She, she was saved at that moment. She goes to Samaria, tells everyone about them, to, the, to those half Gentiles, and they start believing in Jesus too. To, a, to a, a person, a woman that was demeaned and shamed because of her, of her past. Now, this was also the very same people that the disciples had seen when they walked into the village to buy food. Did they say anything? No. They were too busy hungry. They were too busy worried about themselves. But this woman runs back into the village and tells everybody. It never crossed her minds to share with them Yet this woman sees people that desperately needed to meet the Savior. But this woman became the very first, like I said, very first missionary to another nation. You have no idea what's inside that person that you share Jesus to. You have no idea how that person will completely transform the world. So who is your mission? I think Jesus was teaching so many lessons to multiple people here. Jesus' main focus was making disciples, so he used every moment to teach them a lesson in ministry. Because Jesus desired every one of his disciples to have this gift of evangelism, of sharing with others the good news. And there are some people, there's some of you here, that it's just easy to talk to anybody. That you're so much better at this than I ever am. I have to get out of my comfort zone to even talk to you sometimes. I, I, if it was up to me, I like just sitting in the back and just worshiping and I'm good. But, but some of you, you love talking to everybody, and everybody's your friend. My grandma, she was the best at this. She would sit in an airplane, in a, in a, in a, a, a bus. She would go to the grocery store. She, everybody was her friend. And she would talk to them all day, and at the end she would say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus too. <laughs> After she talked about her kids and her grandkids, and her, she would talk about Jesus to them too because she cared about that person. She, she knew, I have a few minutes right now. And, and I could waste it on other stuff, but I'm going to take advantage right now and talk to you about Jesus. And, and I wonder how many people, every time she was on an airplane, how many people were saved because of her? How many lives were transformed because my grandma, sitting there on that airplane, and, and really she only did that a few times in her life, but she was able to simply share Jesus with that person next to her. She didn't care who it was. That could have been a CEO of a company. It could have been some, some rich person. She didn't care. She, they needed Jesus. And she was there to share with them about Jesus. And so everybody is our mission. It's not just the one. It's not just those of you that are just sometimes good at talking to people, have literally the gift of evangelism. You have to be very careful. I know we've been talking about gifts. And I know that some of you now know what your spiritual gift is. You have to understand that your identity is not in the gift. Your identity is God himself. God is your father. You are his son and daughter. That is who you are. So don't get prideful and start saying, well, I have the gift of, of hospitality. I have the gift of faith. I have the gift of evangelism. And so that's who I am. Don't get prideful. That's not your gift. That's God's. He's, he's lending that to you. He's using you in that way. And so, so we need to know that we're all called to be the evangelist, and everybody is our mission. Now, many of you are thinking, well, I'm pretty sure that I don't have that gift. And so am I simply off the hook? The lesson we learn from Jesus to the Samaritan woman is God has strategically placed you where you're at to reach one or to reach some. He has strategically placed you right there 
to reach that one person. When you sit on that bus, when you, when you go to the park, when you go to the bank, just think about it this way. When you're standing in line, and we all hate standing in line, whether it's at the bank or it's at Disneyland or wherever else it is, we hate standing in line. Just think, God put that person in front of you, and there's a person behind you. Their lives could be changed forever. And I know right now we're in COVID time. Stand six feet apart, whatever. Put your mask on. We all got masks on. Just go, hey, <laughs> let me talk to you about Jesus. I know it seems crazy right now to us, but that's an opportunity. And don't, don't start off with just let, let's talk about Jesus. Hey, beautiful day today, huh? Yeah. Just to have, start some small talk and start having that conversation and, and let that open up. So notice that this woman goes back to the town where she was from. It probably was out of her comfort zone, but she felt compelled. She felt like she needed to share with those who did life with her, who did life, the people around her every day, strategically placed there, remember. There's, this, a, there's a Greek word that is mentioned throughout the New Testament, and with this we'll finish, that helps us answer the question. The word is oikos, so you say it in, in Greek. It was an ancient Greek equivalent of a household, of a house, of a, of a family, oikos. Today, if you go to the grocery store, you go look for, for oikos. There's this, this, it's a brand of yogurt, so it's a real word. But it means house, it means home, it means family. And it's usually made up of about 8 to 15 people because, like, you know, Latinos are a lot like Jewish people. We have lots of kids. And so it's not just the two or three. And, and so, and I, and I include myself. I've, no, we, we have two and that's it. Okay, stop asking. But we have, we have uh, uh, but families are big. And so that's what they had. So every, anything between 8 to 15, there was oikos. And in Luke chapter 8, it talks about the demon-possessed man that we talked about last week. It says he returned back to his oikos to his family, to tell them the great things that Jesus did for him. In, in Luke 19, a man named Zacchaeus was told salvation had come to his household, to his oikos, to his family. In John chapter 4, a centurion, basically he was a Roman military commander. He was told that his whole household, his oikos, was saved following the healing of his son. Then in Acts chapter 10, another centurion, this man Cornelius, the first Roman that it says that he believed and received the Holy Spirit, that it says that he was the, the first Roman citizen to speak in tongues also, and his whole oikos, his whole household, his whole family also believed. In Acts 16, the Philippian jailer had his entire household that when, when Paul and Silas were in prison, the Lord opened the gates and they go out that the, that the jailer said, oh no, they're all going to kill me. I better kill myself. And he gets his sword out. Paul says, put your sword away. Jesus did this for us. You want to believe in Jesus? Yes. Let's go to your oikos. Let's go to your house. And they go there. And then his whole family believed and were baptized. Now, what does that look like for us? God has strategically placed you in your family, friendships, neighborhood, workplace to reach out to those who are already you are already doing life with. We talk about going out and do outreach to homeless and to prostitutes and to the drug addicts and, and, and for us to go out. Yes, that's important. But the problem with that is that we see it as a, a, an event, as, as once a month we're going to go do that. No, God has already placed you every day, Monday through Sunday morning. He's placed you there in, with places, with those, with, with those people. So one easy way to think about it is the word France, okay? Again, I'm giving you simple tools. Look at the word France, F-R-A-N-C-E. And in your bulletin, in the inside of your bulletin, you're not, you don't have uh, points today. But I want you to do something very powerful this morning. F is for friends. R is for relatives, a is your acquaintances, people you just meet in line somewhere. Neighbors. N is for neighbors. C is for your coworkers or your classmates. And E is to always keep your eyes open for anybody. That's everybody else also. Use that for E also, everybody. But in your bulletin, I want you to do something powerful. If you have a pen with you, write down specific names that you're, that you're thinking of right now, that you're praying about right now, that you, that you need to begin to pray for. Think about of a specific friend, a specific relative, a specific person, and just say somewhere there at the bank, that, that you, somewhere that you go to every week, 
Every week, you, you know that that's an appointment that you have to go to somewhere at the, at the doctor's office. Those people that, that you don't even know their name, but you know that they work behind a desk somewhere. Pray for that person. Pray for that neighbor. Write that neighbor's name down. Write that coworker or that classmate's name down. So these are the people that you have an opportunity to change and transform their life and their oikos and their house, their family, and future generations. It's just so powerful. Let's, let's watch this as another tool of how to simply share the gospel with someone. Whenever I'm asked a question like that, my first response is there's not really a bad way uh, to share the gospel. We ought to seek to share the gospel any way that we can. I think a priority for us is simply to be friendly. Uh, when we're friendly, a lot of people will want to talk. There's always going to be some people that don't want to talk, but simply approaching someone by being friendly is a huge first step. There's a process that I've followed for over 30 years in my personal witnessing. It's really a three-step process. The first step in the process is to explore. When I meet someone for the first time, I explore their life. I do it in two ways. First, by observing. What, what can I tell about this person by just looking at them or looking at their surroundings if I'm in their home? The pictures they have on the wall, the magazines they have on their table tells me something about them. I want to get to know who the person is. So I explore by first observing and then also by asking questions. As I begin a conversation with a stranger, I let them talk for far more than I talk. I ask a lot of questions. At some point in their answers, they may allude to something spiritually or provide an open door. So the second step of this process after I explore is to stimulate. That's when I bring spiritual things into the conversation. I can do that in a variety of ways. I call these bridges to the gospel, bridging from normal conversation to the gospel. It may be in the form of an intellectual bridge. They've, they've mentioned something about religion, and I can ask them the question, has anyone ever shared with you how the Bible teaches that we become a true Christian, a true follower of Christ. Or it may be a personal opinion bridge. They may have referenced something in the news, and I simply say, in your personal opinion, what do you think makes a person a Christian? That helps to identify what they believe in and usually provides a basis for further conversation. So the first step is to explore. The second is to stimulate. The final step is to share where oftentimes I will share my own testimony or begin the process of sharing the good news with them. It almost sounds like Jesus to me. It sounds like the story. He simply explored this woman, asking her a few questions, and she's talking about the water and the well, and then it turned into a family and her past. Then he started asking questions. What do you believe? And I didn't read the whole chapter. Go ahead and read the whole story later. She starts getting really religious with him and starts saying, well, your people worship in the temple in Jerusalem. My people worship in our own temple. And he gets, she gets really religious because that's how people act sometimes. They, they act like they know it all. And they start telling us, well, yeah, 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 you're, 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 you Christians believe this and this. We believe this and that. And, and, and so that's fine. Because at those moments, you're, you're getting to know who that person is and what, what they believe and how they believe. And then Jesus simply shared with her, I am the way. I am the life. I am the one that's going to give you that living water. At that moment, you have an opportunity to simply say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for my life. You can make your own decisions. That's fine. And I respect you and I honor you because God loves you regardless. But let me tell you what Jesus did for me. And then that's a moment for you to share. Any of you have ever heard of Edward Kimball? Edward Kimball? No. But have you heard of Billy Graham? Yes, you have. This chart right here, if you could show this. Edward Kimball shared to the preacher D.L. Moody, who then shared the gospel to F.B. Meyer, to then share the gospel to Wilbur Chapman, to then share the gospel to another preacher, Billy Sunday. Then that Billy Sunday shared it with Mordecai Ham. This young man named Billy Graham went to this church and heard the gospel for the very first time. And after that, literally millions of people around the world got to know who Jesus Christ was through the ministry of Billy Graham. It says that Edward Kimbrough never shared the gospel to more than maybe hundreds of people in all his life. His church was small. He didn't, but he shared and was faithful 
to those that were there in his oikos, in his family, in his church, and his, with the people that were there. And as he, as, that's what the gospel does. You never know that maybe that person you meet, that person you work with, maybe right now it doesn't seem like a big deal. That person has a son that one day could become a preacher, one day could become a pastor. They keep go, it keeps going, and who knows how many people will come to the Lord because of that. I can't wait when we get to heaven. And someone's going to come up to us and say, listen, you have no idea who I am. But you shared the gospel with like my fourth cousin <laughs> one day when you were out there. You were, you were, you were, you were, you were just somewhere and, and, and you got off to get gas and you shared the gospel with my fourth cousin. That She started going to church and then, and then, and then my fam, family started going to church. And little by little, I got saved because you did that. You never know. And I want to share with you, those of you that are now, all of us have a different testimony. There's some of you that are here because there was a pastor, your dad. Maybe there was a, a, a friend that invited you to church. Maybe, there's, maybe you had a grandma that brought you to church, a mom that brought you to church, and that's why you're here. That's your legacy. Maybe some of you say, I, I came, pastor, because... You're the first, the, this is the church, the first time I went to church, and I accept the Lord here, and, and really, I'm here because of this church. Let me give you where the, your legacy starts, why I'm here right now. There's this woman that I want to share with you, the reason why I'm here, and we'll finish. Her name was Maria Atkinson. Maria Atkinson is, well, let me begin by simply saying, this woman was born in the, in the state of Sonora, Mexico. She was there... And, and uh, she was born from a rich family, very anti-church, very in a culture at that time that they even, they didn't like Catholicism, they didn't like uh, uh, any kind of religion. And so, but they were rich, they were wealthy, they were, her and her sister were very well educated, they went to the best schools there in Mexico, and then she became a teacher. As she became a teacher, she married this man named Atkinson. Then once uh, uh, the, the Civil War began, uh, she moved from be being a teacher uh, to being a nurse. There was a civil war in Mexico, and she was helping there uh, as a nurse. But then, after, uh, after the war, then she simply returned back to teaching. But she was trained now in medicine. Then, as a teacher, she was married to this man named Atkinson, and it was there where she was found out that she had cancer. Now, as the wealthy woman that she was from a wealthy family in Mexico, she, she traveled to the U.S. She went to Phoenix. She went to Tucson. She went to other towns looking for, in Arizona, looking for a doctor that would be able to heal the cancer. Nothing was working. They told her she had only a few months to live. She was going to die of cancer. But there was a woman there. Her name was Maria Ibarra, a woman and her sister who were her servants. This woman, Maria Ibarra, Carmen was her sister. These two women were just servants there in the house of Maria Atkinson. And they told her, they said, uh, excuse me, Miss Atkinson, um, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, uh, interfere. And we, we, we know that you've been sick. We want to let you know that we've been praying for you. And our church, we're called Pentecostal. We believe in healing. We pray for people and they're healed. We invite you to come. And she said, anything works, whatever, I'll, whatever works, I'll try it. And she goes to the church, she is prayed for, and she is healed of cancer 100%. Her life is transformed. Obviously, she gives her life to the Jesus that healed her. She tells her husband, hey, I want to share the gospel. I want to go start churches in my state because there's people that need to know about Jesus. The man said, I don't want anything to do with all that. He leaves her. She says, fine, I'm still going to go be a missionary. She is now called the mother of Mexico. She started so many churches in northern Mexico that continued to, she trained other pastors. And if you could go on to the next screen, this is a church that one day back in the early 30s, 1930s, my, my great uncle, so my great grandma, had a boy who had something that now we probably know that it was polio. And again, the doctors had nothing to, to be able to uh, uh, heal him. And this before any vaccines or anything like that. So, so they weren't able to help him. And so again, my great grandma, 
Maria also, Maria, of course, Maria del Refugio, Mary of the Refuge, that was her name. Uh, we just called her Cuca, <laughs> Nana Cuca. She was, she went to a neighbor and the neighbor said, there's a church up on the hill that they pray for people and there's this woman preacher there that apparently she was healed of cancer and she, was, she, she prays for people and, and what's so awesome is the way that God prepared her. She was from an from a educated home, so she became a strong leader because of her education. The other men, even the men in Mexico, respected her as a, as a woman of God, as a leader, and she trained other pastors. But then also her medical experience helped her understand that when people would come up to the altar and she would say, what, what's wrong with you? And she would say, oh, okay, you have this, this, and this. Medically, that's what this is called. Your pain comes from this. Oh, you have kidney issues. Oh, you have a heart problem. That's what that is. Oh, you have lung. So she was able to diagnose some of the things that was happening. But then she would say, now let me give you the, the doctor that's going to heal you. His name is Jesus. And she would pray for them, and they would be healed. And so my great-grandmother took my great-uncle, little boy, into that church, that same church right there, and he was healed. And my great-grandma receives Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, goes back home, and she has to tell her oikos, her family, her household, her 11 brothers and sisters, and they all started believing and started attending this church. Obviously, that church by then started to multiply in people, and then as the generations went on, my grandma, my mom, and here I am. All because Maria Ibarra, that servant, that lady, said... Can I talk to you about Jesus? To Maria Atkinson. And the many pastors and churches that were established because this one woman, Maria Ibarra, people don't know that name that much as they know Maria Atkinson, but because that one woman was willing to share her story. So today, you have an opportunity. Who knows the Maria Atkinsons that will be transformed because of that? And I wish I could keep going in, in, uh, backwards to who shared the gospel to Maria Ibarra? Who, who, who pastored that church? Who, who, who was able to, to lead her to Jesus? And I wish they would keep going all the way. There's a pastor that, that, that I know that he looks back and he knows he, he's from India. My pastor's pastor, he calls him, his mentor. And, and uh, Pastor Valsi. He's in India, and he goes back 500 years of faith. He goes back and he says, it was, it was Thomas, the disciple, that took the gospel to India, that then, and he starts going through the list of his ancestors, of all the people that took the gospel to his family, and because of them, he says, I'm here right now, and I'm preaching the gospel. And so it's just beautiful to know that what you do right now may seem small. It may just seem like a person, an acquaintance that you just meet and you're sharing Jesus with. It may be someone that you're just sharing some food with, uh, some homeless man, some you're buying them lunch. Who knows the people, the families, the, the, the generations that will be transformed because of that? Today, you have an opportunity. Write those names down or at least just have those names available right there in front of you, right there in your bulletin. Those friends, those, uh, uh, those friends, those relatives, those acquaintances, those neighbors, those co-workers, those classmates. If you could put that one up, brother. Put up that, that chart with the circles again. And just think about that. But can you pray this prayer with me? Just pray with me today this. This simple prayer. Say this with me. Repeat after me. Say, Lord, give me your heart for the lost. Lord, give me your heart for the lost. 